Don't forget to subscribe. Afterwards the wisest and most spiritual books from the greatest authors await you every day. And now buckle up, sit back and we'll begin. Herodotus. The History of Herodotus. Thalia. Against this Amasis then Cambyses the son of Cyrus was making his march, taking with him not only other nations of which he was ruler, but also Hellenes, both Ionians and Aeolians. And the cause of the expedition was as follows. Cambyses sent an envoy to Egypt and asked Amasis to give him his daughter, and he made the request by counsel of an Egyptian. Who brought this upon Amasis having a quarrel with him for the following reason. At the time when Cyrus sent to Amasis and asked him for a physician of the eyes, whosoever was the best of those in Egypt, Amasis had selected him from all the physicians in Egypt, and had torn him away from his wife and children, and delivered him up to Persia. Having, I say, this cause of quarrel, the Egyptian urged Cambyses on by his counsel, bidding him ask Amasis for his daughter, in order that he might either be grieved if he gave her, or if he refused to give her, might offend Cambyses. So Amasis, who was vexed by the power of the Persians and afraid of it, knew neither how to give nor how to refuse. For he was well assured that Cambyses did not intend to have her as his wife, but as a concubine. So making account of the matter thus, he did as follows. There was a daughter of Apries the former king, very tall and comely of form, and the only person left of his house, and her name was Nididus. This girl Amasis adorned with raiment and with gold, and sent her away to Persia as his own daughter. But after a time, when Cambyses saluted her calling her by the name of her father, the girl said to him, O king, thou dost not perceive how thou hast been deceived by Amasis, for he adorned me with ornaments and sent me away giving me to thee as his own daughter. Whereas in truth I am the daughter of Apries against whom Amasis rose up with the Egyptians and murdered him, who was his lord and master. These words uttered and this occasion having arisen, led Cambyses the son of Cyrus against Egypt, moved to very great anger. Such is the report made by the Persians, but as for the Egyptians they claim Cambyses as one of themselves, saying that he was born of this very daughter of Apries, for they say that Cyrus was he who sent to Amasis for his daughter, and not Cambyses. In saying this however they say not rightly, nor can they have failed to observe, for the Egyptians fully as well as any other people are acquainted with the laws and customs of the Persians, first that it is not customary among them for a bastard to become king, when there is a son born of a true marriage, and secondly that Cambyses was the son of Cassandane, the daughter of Pharnasps, a man of the Achaemenid family and not the son of the Egyptian woman. But they pervert the truth of history, claiming to be kindred with the house of Cyrus. Thus it is with these matters, and the following story is also told, which for my part I do not believe, namely that one of the Persian women came into the wives of Cyrus, and when she saw standing by the side of Cassandane children comely of form and tall, she was loud in her praises of them, expressing great admiration, and Cassandane, who was the wife of Cyrus, spoke as follows. Nevertheless, though I am the mother of such children of these, Cyrus treats me with dishonor and holds in honor her whom he has brought in from Egypt. Thus she spoke, they say, being vexed by Nididus, and upon that Cambyses the elder of her sons said. For this cause, mother, when I am grown to be a man, I will make that which is above in Egypt to be below, and that which is below above. This he is reported to have said when he was perhaps about ten years old, and the women were astonished by it. And he, they say, 
kept it ever in mind, and so at last when he had become a man and had obtained the royal power, he made the expedition against Egypt. Another thing also contributed to this expedition, which was as follows. There was among the foreign mercenaries of Amasis a man who was by race of Halicarnassos, and his name was Fanes, one who was both capable in judgment and valiant in that which pertained to war. This Fanes, having, as we may suppose, some quarrel with Amasis, fled away from Egypt in a ship, desiring to come to speech with Cambyses. And as he was of no small repute among the mercenaries, and was very closely acquainted with all the affairs of Egypt, Amasis pursued him and considered it a matter of some moment to capture him. And he pursued by sending after him the most trusted of his eunuchs with a trireme, who captured him in Lycia, but having captured him he did not bring him back to Egypt, since Fanes got the better of him by cunning, for he made his guards drunk and escaped to Persia. So when Cambyses had made his resolve to march upon Egypt, and was in difficulty about the march, as to how he should get safely through the waterless region, this man came to him, and besides informing of the other matters of Amasis, he instructed him also as to the march, advising him to send to the king of the Arabians, and asked that he would give him safety of passage through this region. Now by this way only is there a known entrance to Egypt. For from Phoenicia to the borders of the city of Cadatus belongs to the Syrians who are called of Palestine, and from Cadatus, which is a city I suppose not much less than Sardis, from this city the trading stations on the sea coast, as far as the city of Ionissos belong to the king of Arabia, and then from Ionissos again the country belongs to the Syrians as far as the Serbonian lake, along the side of which Mount Cajun extends towards the sea. After that, from the Serbonian lake, in which the story goes the Tiffin is concealed, from this point onwards the land is Egypt. Now the region which lies between the city of Ionissos on the one hand and Mount Cajun and the Serbonian lake on the other, which is of no small extent but as much as a three days journey, is grievously destitute of water. And one thing I shall tell of, which few of those who go in ships to Egypt have observed, and it is this, into Egypt from all parts of Hellas and also from Phoenicia, are brought twice every year earthenware jars full of wine, and yet it may almost be said that you cannot see there one single empty wine jar. In what manner, then, it will be asked, are they used up? This also I will tell. The headman of each place must collect all the earthenware jars from his own town and convey them to Memphis, and those at Memphis must fill them with water, and convey them to these same waterless regions of Syria. This the jars which come regularly to Egypt and are emptied there, are carried to Syria to be added to that which has come before. It was the Persians who thus prepared this approach to Egypt, furnishing it with water in the manner which has been said from the time when they first took possession of Egypt. But at the time of which I speak, seeing that water was not yet provided, Cambyses, in accordance with what he was told by his Halicarnassian guest, sent envoys to the Arabian king and from him, asked and obtained the safe passage. Having given him pledges of friendship and received them from him in return, now the Arabians have respect for pledges of friendship, as much as those men in all the world who regard them most, and they give them in the following manner. A man different from those who desire to give the pledges to one another, standing in the midst between the two, cuts with a sharp stone the inner parts of the hands, along by the thumbs, of those who are giving the pledges to one another, and then he takes a thread from the cloak of each one, 
and smears with the blood, seven stones laid in the midst between them, and as he does this, he calls upon Dionysos and Urania. When the man has completed these ceremonies, he who has given the pledges commends to the care of his friends the stranger, or the fellow tribesman, if he is giving the pledges to one who is a member of his tribe, and the friends think it right that they also should have regard for the pledges given. Of gods they believe in Dionysos and Urania alone. Moreover they say that the cutting of their hair is done after the same fashion as that of Dionysos himself, and they cut their hair in a circle round, shaving away the hair of the temples. Now they call Dionysos Aratalt and Urania they call Alalit. So then when the Arabian king had given the pledge of friendship to the men who had come to him from Cambyses, he contrived as follows. He took skins of camels and filled them with water, and loaded them upon the backs of all the living camels that he had, and having so done he drove them to the waterless region and there awaited the army of Cambyses. This which has been related is the more credible of the accounts given, but the less credible must also be related, since it is a current account. There is a great river in Arabia called Khoris, and this runs out into the sea which is called Erythraean. From this river then it is said that the king of the Arabians, having got a conduit pipe made by sewing together raw ox hides and other skins, of such a length as to reach to the waterless region, conducted the water through these forsooth, nine, and had great cisterns dug in the waterless region, that they might receive the water and preserve it. Now it is a journey of twelve days from the river to this waterless region, and moreover the story says that he conducted the water by three ten conduit pipes to three different parts of it. Meanwhile Samanidos the son of Amasis was encamped at the Pelusian mouth of the Nile, waiting for the coming of Cambyses. For Cambyses did not find Amasis yet living when he marched upon Egypt, but Amasis had died after having reigned forty and four years, during which no great misfortune had befallen him. And when he had died and had been embalmed, he was buried in the burial place in the temple, which he had built for himself. Now when Samanito's son of Amasis was reigning as king, there happened to the Egyptians a prodigy, the greatest that had ever happened. For rain fell at Thebes in Egypt, where never before had rain fallen, nor afterwards down to my time, as the Thebans themselves say, for in the upper parts of Egypt, no rain falls at all. But at the time of which I speak rain fell at Thebes in a drizzling shower. Now when the Persians had marched quite through the waterless region and were encamped near the Egyptians with design to engage battle, then the foreign mercenaries of the Egyptian king, who were Hellenes and Carians, having a quarrel with Fanes because he had brought against Egypt an army of foreign speech, contrived against him as follows. Fanes had children whom he had left behind in Egypt. These they brought to their camp and into the sight of their father, and they set up a mixing bowl between the two camps, and after that they brought up the children one by one, and cut their throats, so that the blood ran into the bowl. Then when they had gone through the whole number of the children, they brought and poured into the bowl both wine and water, and not until the mercenaries had all drunk of the blood did they engage battle. Then after a battle had been fought with great stubbornness, and very many had fallen of both the armies, the Egyptians at length turned to flight. I was witness moreover of a great marvel, being informed of it by the natives of the place, for of the bones scattered about of those who fell in this fight, each side separately, since the bones of the Persians were lying apart on one side, according as they were divided at first, and those of the Egyptians on the other, 
The skulls of the Persians are so weak that if you shall hit them only with a pebble, you will make a hole in them. While those of the Egyptians are so exceedingly strong that you would hardly break them if you struck them with a large stone. The cause of it, they say, was this, and I for my part readily believe them, namely that the Egyptians beginning from their early childhood shaved their heads, and the bone is thickened by exposure to the sun. And this is also the cause of their not becoming bald-headed, for among the Egyptians, you see fewer bald-headed men than among any other race. This then is the reason why these have their skulls strong, and the reason why the Persians have theirs weak, is that they keep them delicately in the shade from the first by wearing tiaras, that is felt caps. So far of this, and I saw also a similar thing to this at Papyrmus, in the case of those who were slain together with Achimenes the son of Darius by Inaros the Libyan. The Egyptians when they turned to flight from the battle fled in disorder. And they being shut up in Memphis, Cambyses is sent a ship of Mytilene up the river bearing a Persian herald, to summon the Egyptians to make terms of surrender, but they, when they saw the ship had entered into Memphis, pouring forth in a body from the fortress, both destroyed the ship, and also tore the men in it limb from limb, and so bore them into the fortress. After this the Egyptians being besieged, in course of time surrendered themselves, and the Libyans who dwell on the borders of Egypt, being struck with terror by that which had happened to Egypt, delivered themselves up without resistance, and they both laid on themselves a tribute and sent presents. Likewise also those of Kyrene and Barca, being struck with terror equally with the Libyans, acted in a similar manner. And Cambyses accepted graciously the gifts which came from the Libyans, but as for those which came from the men of Kyrene, finding fault with them, as I suppose, because they were too small in amount, for the Kyrenians sent in fact 500 pounds weight of silver, he took the silver by handfuls and scattered it with his own hand among his soldiers. On the tenth day after that on which he received the surrender of the fortress of Memphis, Cambyses set the king of the Egyptian Samanidos, who had been king for six months, to sit in the suburb of the city, to do him dishonor him I say with other Egyptians he sat there, and he proceeded to make trial of his spirit as follows. Having arrayed his daughter in the clothing of a slave, he sent her forth with a pitcher to fetch water. And with her he sent also other maidens chosen from the daughters of the chief men, arrayed as was the daughter of the king. And as the maidens were passing by their fathers with cries and lamentation, the other men all began to cry out and lament aloud, seeing that their children had been evilly entreated, but Samanitos when he saw it before his eyes, and perceived it bent himself down to the earth. Then when the water-bearers had passed by, next Cambyses sent his son with two thousand Egyptians besides who were of the same age. With ropes bound round their necks and bits placed in their mouths, and these were being led away to execution to avenge the death of the Mytilenians, who had been destroyed at Memphis with their ship. For the royal judges seventeen had decided that for each man ten of the noblest Egyptians should lose their lives in retaliation. He then, when he saw them passing out by him and perceived that his son was leading the way eighteen to die, did the same as he had done with respect to his daughter, while the other Egyptians who sat round him were lamenting and showing signs of grief. When these also had passed by, it chanced that a man of his table companions, advanced in years, who had been deprived of all his possessions, and had nothing except such things as a beggar possesses, and was asking alms from the soldiers, 
passed by Samanidos the son of Amasis and the Egyptians who were sitting in the suburb of the city. And when Samanidos saw him he uttered a great cry of lamentation. And he called his companion by name and beat himself upon the head. Now there was, it seems, men set to watch him, who made known to Cambyses all that he did on the occasion of each going forth. And Cambyses marveled at that which he did, and he sent a messenger and asked him thus. Samanidos, thy master Cambyses asks thee for what reason, when thou sawest thy daughter evilly entreated and thy son going to death. Thou didst not cry aloud nor lament for them. Whereas thou didst honor with these signs of grief the beggar who, as he hears from others, is not in any way related to thee? Thus he asked, and the other answered as follows. O son of Cyrus, my own troubles were too great for me to lament them aloud, but the trouble of my companion was such as called for tears, seeing that he has been deprived of great wealth and has come to beggary upon the threshold of old age. When this saying was reported by the messenger, it seemed to them that it was well spoken, and, as is reported by the Egyptians, Croesus shed tears, for he also, as fortune would have it, had accompanied Cambyses to Egypt, and the Persians who were present shed tears also, and there entered some pity into Cambyses himself, and forthwith he bade them save the life of the son of Samanidos from among those who were being put to death. And also he bade them raise Samanidos himself from his place in the suburb of the city, and bring him into his own presence. As for the son, those who went for him found that he was no longer alive, but had been cut down first of all. But Samanidos himself they raised from his place, and brought him into the presence of Cambyses, with whom he continued to live for the rest of his time without suffering any violence, and if he had known how to keep himself from meddling with mischief, he would have received Egypt so as to be ruler of it. Since the Persians are wont to honor the sons of kings, and even if the kings have revolted from them, they give back the power into the hands of their sons. Of this, namely that it is their established rule to act so, one may judge by many instances besides and especially by the case of Thaniris, the son of Inaros, who received back the power which his father had, and by that of Pausiris, the son of Amerdeos, for he too received back the power of his father. Yet it is certain that no men ever up to this time did more evil to the Persians than Inaros and Amerdeos. As it was, however, Samanidos devised evil and received the due reward. For he was found to be inciting the Egyptians to revolt, and when this became known to Cambyses, Samanidos drank bull's blood and died forthwith. Thus he came to his end. From Memphis Cambyses came to the city of Say with the purpose of doing that which in fact he did. For when he had entered into the palace of Amasis, he forthwith gave command to bring the corpse of Amasis forth out of his burial place, and when this had been accomplished, he gave command to scourge it and pluck out the hair and stab it, and to do to it dishonor in every possible way besides. And when they had done this too until they were wearied out, for the corpse being embalmed held out against the violence, and did not fall to pieces in any part, Cambyses gave command to consume it with fire, enjoining thereby a thing which was not permitted by religion. For the Persians hold fire to be a god. To consume corpses with fire then is by no means according to the custom of either people, of the Persians for the reason which has been mentioned, since they say that it is not right to give the dead body of a man to a god, while the Egyptians have the belief established that fire is a living wild beast, and that it devours everything which it catches. 
and when it is satiated with the food it dies itself together with that which it devours. But it is by no means their custom to give the corpse of a man to wild beasts, for which reason they embalm it, that it may not be eaten by worms as it lies in the tomb. Thus then Cambyses was enjoining them to do that which is not permitted by the customs of either people. However, the Egyptians say that it was not Amasis who suffered this outrage, but another of the Egyptians who was of the same stature of body as Amasis, and that to him the Persians did outrage, thinking that they were doing it to Amasis. For they say that Amasis learned from an oracle that which was about to happen with regard to himself after his death, and accordingly, to avert the evil which threatened to come upon him. He buried the dead body of this man who was scored within his own sepulchral chamber near the doors, and enjoined his son to lay his own body as much as possible in the inner recess of the chamber. These injunctions, said to have been given by Amasis with regard to his burial and with regard to the man mentioned, were not in my opinion really given at all but I think that the Egyptians make pretense of it from pride and with no good ground. After this Cambyses planned three several expeditions, one against the Carthaginians, another against the Ammonians, and a third against the long-lived Ethiopians, who dwell in that part of Libya which is by the southern sea. And in forming these designs he resolved to send his naval force against the Carthaginians, and a body chosen from his land army against the Ammonians, and to the Ethiopians to send spies first. Both to see whether the table of the sun existed really, which is said to exist among these Ethiopians, and in addition to this to spy out all else but pretending to be bearers of gifts for their king. Now the table of the sun is said to be as follows. There is a meadow in the suburb of their city full of flesh meat boiled of all four-footed creatures, and in this, it is said, those of the citizens who are in authority at the time place the flesh by night, managing the matter carefully and by day any man who wishes comes there and feasts himself, and the natives, it is reported, say that the earth of herself produces these things continually. Of such nature is the so-called table of the sun said to be. So when Cambyses had resolved to send the spies, forthwith he sent for those men of the Ethiophagoi who understood the Ethiopian tongue, to come from the city of Elephantine, and while they were going to fetch these men, he gave command to the fleet to sail against Carthage. But the Phoenicians said that they would not do so, for they were bound not to do so by solemn vows. And they would not be acting piously if they made expedition against their own sons. And as the Phoenicians were not willing, the rest were rendered unequal to the attempt. Thus then the Carthaginians escaped being enslaved by the Persians, for Cambyses did not think it right to apply force to compel the Phoenicians, both because they had delivered themselves over to the Persians of their own accord, and because the whole naval force was dependent upon the Phoenicians. Now the men of Cyprus also had delivered themselves over to the Persians, and were joining in the expedition against Egypt. Then as soon as the Ichthyophagoi came to Cambyses from Elephantine, he sent them to the Ethiopians, enjoining them what they should say, and giving them gifts to bear with them, that is to say a purple garment, and a collar of twisted gold with bracelets, and an alabaster box of perfumed ointment, and a jar of palm wine. Now these Ethiopians to whom Cambyses was sending are said to be the tallest and the most beautiful of all men, and besides other customs which they are reported to have different from other men, there is especially this, it is said, with regard to their regal power whomsoever of the men of their nation, they judge to be the tallest, 
and to have strength in proportion to his stature, this man they appoint to reign over them. So when the Ichthyophagoi had come to this people they presented their gifts to the king who ruled over them, and at the same time they said as follows. The king of the Persians Cambyses, desiring to become a friend and guest to thee, sent us with command to come to speech with thee, and he gives thee for gifts these things which he himself most delights to use. The Ethiopian, however, perceiving that they had come as spies, spoke to them as follows. Neither did the king of the Persians send you bearing gifts because he thought it a matter of great moment to become my guest friend, nor do ye speak true things, for ye have come as spies of my kingdom, nor again is he a righteous man, for if he had been righteous, he would not have coveted a land other than his own nor would he be leading away into slavery men at whose hands he has received no wrong. Now however give him this bow and speak to him these words. The king of the Ethiopians gives this counsel to the king of the Persians, that when the Persians draw their bows, of equal size to mine, as easily as I do this, then he should march against the long-lived Ethiopians provided that he be superior in numbers, but until that time he should feel gratitude to the gods that they do not put it into the mind of the sons of the Ethiopians to acquire another land in addition to their own. Having thus said and having unbent the bow, he delivered it to those who had come. Then he took the garment of purple and asked what it was and how it had been made, and when the Ichthyophagoi had told him the truth about the purple fish and the dying of the tissue, he said that the men were deceitful and deceitful, also were their garments. Then secondly he asked concerning the twisted gold of the collar and the bracelets, and when the Ichthyophagoi were setting forth to him the manner in which it was fashioned, the king broke into a laugh and said, supposing them to be fetters, that they had stronger fetters than those in their country. Thirdly he asked about the perfumed ointment, and when they had told him of the manner of its making and of the anointing with it, he said the same as he had said before about the garment. Then when he came to the wine, and had learned about the manner of its making, being exceedingly delighted with the taste of the drink he asked besides what food the king ate, and what was the longest time that a Persian man lived. They told him that he ate bread, explaining to him first the manner of growing the wheat, and they said that eighty years was the longest term of life appointed for a Persian man. In answer to this the Ethiopian said that he did not wonder that they lived, but a few years, when they fed upon dung, for indeed they would not be able to live even so many years as this, if they did not renew their vigor with the drink, indicating to the Ichthyophagoi the wine, for in regard to this, he said, his people were much behind the Persians. Then when the Ichthyophagoi asked the king in return about the length of days and the manner of life of his people, he answered that the greater number of them reached the age of a hundred and twenty years, and some surpassed even this, and their food was boiled flesh, and their drink was milk. And when the spies marveled at the number of years, he conducted them to a certain spring, in the water of which they washed and became more sleek of skin, as if it were a spring of oil, and from it there came a scent as it were of violets. And the water of this spring, said the spies, was so exceedingly weak that it was not possible for anything to float upon it, either wood or any of those things which are lighter than wood. But they all went to the bottom. If this water which they have be really such as it is said to be, it would doubtless be the cause why the people are long-lived, as making use of it for all the purposes of life. Then when they departed from this spring, he led them to a prison house for men, and there all were bound in fetters of gold. 
Now among these Ethiopians bronze is the rarest and most precious of all things. Then when they had seen the prison house they saw also the so-called table of the sun. And after this they saw last of all their receptacles of dead bodies, which are said to be made of crystal in the following manner. When they have dried the corpse, whether it be after the Egyptian fashion or in some other way, they cover it over completely with plaster and then adorn it with painting, making the figure as far as possible like the living man. After this they put about it a block of crystal hollowed out, for this they dig up in great quantity, and it is very easy to work. And the dead body being in the middle of the block is visible through it, but produces no unpleasant smell, nor any other effect which is unseemly, and it has all its parts visible like the dead body itself. For a year then they who are most nearly related to the man keep the block in their house, giving to the dead man the first share of everything, and offering to him sacrifices. And after this period they carry it out and set it up round about the city. After they had seen all, the spies departed to go back, and when they reported these things, Forthwith Cambyses was enraged and proceeded to march his army against the Ethiopians, not having ordered any provision of food, nor considered with himself that he was intending to march an army to the furthest extremities of the earth, but as one who is mad and not in his right senses. When he heard the report of the Ichthyophagoi he began the march, ordering those of the Hellenes who were present to remain behind in Egypt, and taking with him his whole land force. And when in the course of his march he had arrived at Thebes, he divided off about fifty thousand of his army, and these he enjoined to make slaves of the Ammonians, and to set fire to the seat of the Oracle of Zeus. But he himself with the remainder of his army went on against the Ethiopians, but before the army had passed over the fifth part of the way, all that they had of provisions came to an end completely, and then after the provisions the beasts of burden also were eaten up and came to an end. Now if Cambyses when he perceived this had changed his plan and led his army back, he would have been a wise man in spite of twenty-two his first mistake, as it was, however, he paid no regard, but went on forward without stopping. The soldiers accordingly, so long as they were able to get anything from the ground, prolonged their lives by eating grass, but when they came to the sand, some did a fearful deed, that is to say, out of each company of ten, they selected by lot one of themselves and devoured him. And Cambyses, when he heard it, being alarmed by the seeding of one another gave up the expedition against the Ethiopians and set forth to go back again, and he arrived at Thebes having suffered loss of a great number of his army. Then from Thebes he came down to Memphis and allowed the Hellenes to sail away home. Thus fared the expedition against the Ethiopians, and those of the Persians who had been sent to march against the Ammonians set forth from Thebes and went on their way with guides, and it is known that they arrived at the city of Oasis, which is inhabited by Samians said to be of the Ashreonian tribe, and is distant seven days' journey from Thebes over sandy desert. Now this place is called in the speech of the Hellenes the Isle of the Blessed, it is said that the army reached this place, but from that point onwards, except the Ammonians themselves and those who have heard the account from them, no man is able to say anything about them, for they neither reached the Ammonians nor returned back. This however is added to the story by the Ammonians themselves. They say that as the army was going from this oasis through the sandy desert to attack them, and had got to a point about midway between them and the oasis, 
while they were taking their morning meal a violent south wind blew upon them, and bearing with it heaps of the desert sand it buried them under it, and so they disappeared and were seen no more. Thus the Ammonians say that it came to pass with regard to this army. When Cambyses arrived at Memphis, a piss appeared to the Egyptians, whom the Hellenes call Apaphos. And when he had appeared, forthwith the Egyptians began to wear their fairest garments and to have festivities. Cambyses accordingly seeing the Egyptians doing thus, and supposing that they were certainly acting so by way of rejoicing because he had fared ill, called for the officers who had charge of Memphis, and when they had come into his presence, he asked them why when he was at Memphis on the former occasion, the Egyptians were doing nothing of this kind, but only now, when he came there after losing a large part of his army. They said that a god had appeared to them, who was wont to appear at intervals of long time, and that whenever he appeared, then all the Egyptians rejoiced and kept festival. Hearing this Cambyses said that they were lying, and as liars he condemned them to death. Having put these to death, next he called the priests into his presence, and when the priests answered him after the same manner, he said that it should not be without his knowledge if a tame god had come to the Egyptians, and having so said he bade the priests bring a piss away into his presence. So they went to bring him. Now this Apis of Paphos is a calf born of a cow who after this is not permitted to conceive any other offspring, and the Egyptians say that a flash of light comes down from heaven upon this cow, and of this she produces a piss. This calf which is called a piss is black and has the following signs, namely a white square upon the forehead, and on the back the likeness of an eagle and in the tail the hairs are double, and on the tongue there is a mark like a beetle. 29. When the priests had brought a piss, Cambyses being somewhat affected with madness, drew his dagger, and aiming at the belly of a piss, struck his thigh. Then he laughed and said to the priests, O ye wretched creatures, are gods born such as this, with blood and flesh, and sensible of the stroke of iron weapons? Worthy indeed of Egyptians is such a god as this. Ye however at least shall not escape without punishment for making a mock of me. Having thus spoken he ordered those whose duty it was to do such things, to scourge the priests without mercy, and to put to death any one of the other Egyptians whom they should find keeping the festival. Thus the festival of the Egyptians had been brought to an end, and the priests were being chastised, and a piss wounded by the stroke in his thigh, lay dying in the temple. Him, when he had brought his life to an end by reason of the wound, the priests buried without the knowledge of Cambyses. But Cambyses, as the Egyptians say, immediately after this evil deed became absolutely mad not having been really in his right senses even before that time. And the first of his evil deeds was that he put to death his brother Smyrtus, who was of the same father and the same mother as himself. This brother he had sent away from Egypt to Persia in envy, because alone of all the Persians, he had been able to draw the bow which the Ichthyophagoi brought from the Ethiopian king to an extent of about two finger breadths, while of the other Persians, not one had proved able to do this. Then when Smyrtus had gone away to Persia, Cambyses saw a vision in his sleep of this kind. It seemed to him that a messenger came from Persia, and reported that Smyrtus sitting upon the royal throne, had touched the heaven with his head. Fearing therefore with regard to this lest his brother might slay him and reign in his stead, he sent Presasps to Persia, the man whom of all the Persians he trusted most, with command to slay him. He accordingly went up to Susa and slew Smyrtus, 
and some say that he took him out of the chase and so slew him, others that he brought him to the Erythraean Sea and drowned him. This they say was the first beginning of the evil deeds of Cambyses, and next after this he put to death his sister, who had accompanied him to Egypt, to whom also he was married, she being his sister by both parents. Now he took her to wife in the following manner, for before this the Persians had not been wont at all to marry their sisters. Cambyses fell in love with one of his sisters, and desired to take her to wife, so since he had it in mind to do that which was not customary, he called the royal judges, and asked them whether there existed any law which permitted him who desired it to marry his sister. Now the royal judges are men chosen out from among the Persians, and hold their office until they die, or until some injustice is found in them, so long and no longer. These pronounce decisions for the Persians and are the expounders of the ordinances of their fathers, and all matters are referred to them. So when Cambyses asked them, they gave him an answer which was both upright and safe, saying that they found no law which permitted a brother to marry his sister, but apart from that they had found a law to the effect that the king of the Persians might do whatsoever he desired. Thus on the one hand they did not tamper with the law for fear of Cambyses, and at the same time, that they might not perish themselves in maintaining the law, they found another law beside that which was asked for, which was in favor of him who wished to marry his sisters. So Cambyses at that time took to wife her with whom he was in love, but after no long time he took another sister. Of these it was the younger whom he put to death, she having accompanied him to Egypt. About her death, as about the death of Smyrtus, two different stories are told. The Hellenes say that Cambyses had matched a lion's cub in fight with a dog's whelp, and this wife of his was also a spectator of it, and when the whelp was being overcome, another whelp, its brother, broke its chain and came to help it, and having become two instead of one, the whelps then got the better of the cub, and Cambyses was pleased at the sight. But she sitting by him began to weep, and Cambyses perceived it and asked wherefore she wept, and she said that she had wept when she saw that the whelp had come to the assistance of its brother, because she remembered Smyrtus, and perceived that there was no one who would come to his assistance. The Hellenes say that it was for this saying that she was killed by Cambyses. But the Egyptians say that as they were sitting round a table, the wife took a lettuce and pulled off the leaves all round, and then asked her husband whether the lettuce was fairer when thus plucked round or when covered with leaves, and he said when covered with leaves. She then spoke thus. Nevertheless thou didst once produce the likeness of this lettuce. When thou didst strip bare the house of Cyrus. And he moved to anger leapt upon her, being with child, and she miscarried and died. These were the acts of madness done by Cambyses towards those of his own family, whether the madness was produced really on account of a piss or from some other cause as many ills are wont to seize upon men, for it is said moreover that Cambyses had from his birth a certain grievous malady, that which is called by some the sacred disease. And it was certainly nothing strange that when the body was suffering from a grievous malady, the mind should not be sound either. The following also are acts of madness which he did to the other Persians. To Presasps, the man whom he honored most and who used to bear his messages 2601, his son also was cup-bearer to Cambyses, and this too was no small honor to him, it is said that he spoke as follows. Presasps, what kind of a man do the Persians esteem me to be, and what speech do they hold concerning me? And he said, Master, 
in all other respects thou art greatly commended, but they say that thou art overmuch given to love of wine. Thus he spoke concerning the Persians, and upon that Cambyses was roused to anger, and answered thus. It appears then that the Persians say I am given to wine, and that therefore I am beside myself and not in my right mind, and their former speech then was not sincere. For before this time, it seems, when the Persians in Croesus were sitting with him in council, Cambyses asked what kind of a man they thought he was as compared with his father Cyrus, and they answered that he was better than his father, for he not only possessed all that his father had possessed, but also in addition to this had acquired Egypt and the sea. Thus the Persians spoke, but Croesus, who was present and was not satisfied with their judgment, spoke thus to Cambyses. To me, O son of Cyrus, thou dost not appear to be equal to thy father, for not yet hast thou a son, such as he left behind him in you. Hearing this Cambyses was pleased, and commended the judgment of Croesus. So calling to mind this, he said in anger to Presasps, Learn then now for thyself whether the Persians speak truly, or whether when they say this they are themselves out of their senses. For if I, shooting at thy son there standing before the entrance of the chamber, hit him in the very middle of the heart, the Persians will be proved to be speaking falsely, but if I miss, then thou mayest say that the Persians are speaking the truth, and that I am not in my right mind. Having thus said he drew his bow and hit the boy, and when the boy had fallen down, it is said that he ordered them to cut open his body, and examine the place where he was hit, and as the arrow was found to be sticking in the heart, he laughed and was delighted, and said to the father of the boy, Presasps, it has now been made evident, as thou seest, that I am not mad, but that it is the Persians who are out of their senses, and now tell me, whom of all men didst thou ever see before this time hit the mark so well in shooting? Then Presasps, seeing that the man was not in his right senses and fearing for himself, said, Master, I think that not even God himself could have hit the mark so fairly. Thus he did at that time. And at another time he condemned twelve of the Persians, men equal to the best, on a charge of no moment, and buried them alive with the head downwards. When he was doing these things, Croesus the Lydian judged it right to admonish him in the following words. O king, do not thou indulge the heat of thy youth and passion in all things, but retain and hold thyself back. It is a good thing to be prudent, and forethought is wise. Thou however are putting to death men who are of thine own people, condemning them on charges of no moment, and thou art putting to death men's sons also. If thou do many such things, beware lest the Persians make revolt from thee. As for me, thy father Cyrus gave me charge, earnestly bidding me to admonish thee, and suggest to thee that which I should find to be good. Thus he counseled him, manifesting good will towards him, but Cambyses answered, Dost thou venture to counsel me, who excellently well didst rule thine own country, and well didst counsel my father, bidding him pass over the river Araxes and go against the Mesagetai, when they were willing to pass over into our land, and so didst utterly ruin thyself by ill government of thine own land, and didst utterly ruin Cyrus, who followed thy counsel. However thou shalt not escape punishment now, for know that before this I had very long been desiring to find some occasion against thee. Thus having said he took his bow meaning to shoot him, but Croesus started up and ran out, and so since he could not shoot him, he gave orders to his attendants to take and slay him. The attendants, however, 
knowing his moods, concealed Croesus with the intention that if Cambyses should change his mind and seek to have Croesus again, they might produce him and receive gifts as the price of saving his life, but if he did not change his mind nor feel desire to have him back, then they might kill him. Not long afterwards Cambyses did in fact desire to have Croesus again, and the attendants perceiving this reported to him that he was still alive. And Cambyses said that he rejoiced with Croesus that he was still alive, but that they who had preserved him should not get off free, but he would put them to death. And thus he did. Many such acts of madness did he both to Persians and allies, remaining at Memphis and opening ancient tombs and examining the dead bodies. Likewise also he entered into the temple of Hephaestos and very much derided the image of the god. For the image of Hephaestos very nearly resembles the Phoenician Patekoi, which the Phoenicians carry about on the prows of their triremes, and for him who has not seen these, I will indicate its nature it is the likeness of a dwarfish man. He entered also into the temple of the Kiberoi, into which it is not lawful for any one to enter, except a priest only, and the images there he even set on fire, after much mockery of them. Now these also are like the images of Hephaestos, and it is said that they are the children of that god. It is clear to me therefore by every kind of proof that Cambyses was mad exceedingly, for otherwise he would not have attempted to deride religious rites and customary observances. For if one should propose to all men a choice, bidding them select the best customs from all the customs that there are, each race of men, after examining them all, would select those of his own people, thus all think that their own customs are by far the best. And so it is not likely that any but a madman would make a jest of such things. Now of the fact that all men are thus wont to think about their customs, we may judge by many other proofs, and more specially by this which follows. Darius in the course of his reign summoned those of the Hellenes who were present in his land, and asked them for what price they would consent to eat up their fathers when they died, and they answered that for no price would they do so. After this Darius summoned those Indians who are called Calatians, who eat their parents, and asked them in presence of the Hellenes, who understood what they said by help of an interpreter, for what payment they would consent to consume with fire the bodies of their fathers when they died, and they cried out aloud and bade him keep silence from such words. Thus then these things are established by usage, and I think that Pindar spoke rightly in his verse, when he said that of all things law is king. Now while Cambyses was marching upon Egypt, the Lacedaemonians also had made an expedition against Samos and against Polycrates the son of Aix, who had risen against the government and obtained rule over Samos. At first he had divided the state into three parts, and had given a share to his brothers Pantagnotos and Solosan, but afterwards he put to death one of these, and the younger, namely Solosan, he drove out, and so obtained possession of the whole of Samos. Then, being in possession, 29, he made a guest friendship with Amasis the king of Egypt, sending him gifts and receiving gifts in return from him. After this straightway within a short period of time the power of Polycrates increased rapidly, and there was much fame of it not only in Ionia, but also over the rest of Hellas. For to whatever party directed his forces, everything went fortunately for him. And he had got for himself a hundred fifty oared galleys and a thousand archers, and he plundered from all making no distinction of any, for it was his wont to say that he would win more gratitude from his friend by giving back to him that which he had taken, 
than by not taking at all. So he had conquered many of the islands and also many cities of the continent, and besides other things he gained the victory in a sea fight over the lesbians, as they were coming to help the Milesians with their forces, and conquered them. These men dug the whole trench round the wall of the city of Samos working in chains. Now Amasis, as may be supposed, did not fail to perceive that Polycrates was very greatly fortunate, and it was to him an object of concern, and as much more good fortune yet continued to come to Polycrates, he wrote upon a paper these words and sent them to Samos. Amasis to Polycrates thus saith. It is a pleasant thing indeed to hear that one who is a friend and guest is faring well, yet to me thy great good fortune is not pleasing. Since I know that the divinity is jealous, and I think that I desire, both for myself and for those about whom I have care, that in some of our affairs, we should be prosperous and in others should fail, and thus go through life alternately faring well and ill, rather than that we should be prosperous in all things. For never yet did I hear tell of any one who was prosperous in all things, and did not come to an utterly evil end at the last. Now therefore do thou follow my counsel and act as I shall say with respect to thy prosperous fortunes. Take thought and consider, and that which thou findest to be the most valued by thee, and for the loss of which thou wilt most be vexed in thy soul, that take and cast away in such a manner, that it shall never again come to the sight of men, and if in future from that time forward good fortune does not befall thee in alternation with calamities, apply remedies in the manner by me suggested. Polycrates, Having read this and having perceived by reflection that Amasis suggested to him good counsel, sought to find which one of his treasures he would be most afflicted in his soul to lose, and seeking he found this which I shall say. He had a signet which he used to wear, anxious in gold and made of an emerald stone, and it was the work of Theodoros the son of Telecles of Samos. Seeing then that he thought it good to cast this away, he did thus. He manned a fifty-oared galley with sailors and went on board of it himself, and then he bade them put out into the deep sea. And when he had got to a distance from the island, he took off the signet ring, and in the sight of all who were with him in the ship he threw it into the sea. Thus having done he sailed home, and when he came to his house he mourned for his loss. But on the fifth or sixth day after these things it happened to him as follows. A fisherman having caught a large and beautiful fish, thought it right that this should be given as a gift to Polycrates. He bore it therefore to the door of the palace, and said that he desired to come into the presence of Polycrates, and when he had obtained this, he gave him the fish, saying, O king, having taken this fish I did not think fit to bear it to the market, although I am one who lives by the labor of his hands, but it seemed to me that it was worthy of thee and of thy monarchy. Therefore I bring it and present it to thee. He then, being pleased at the words spoken, answered thus, Thou didst exceedingly well, and double thanks are due to thee, for thy words and also for thy gift, and we invite thee to come to dinner. The fisherman then, thinking this a great thing, went away to this house, and the servants as they were cutting up the fish found in its belly the signet ring of Polycrates. Then as soon as they had seen it and taken it up, they bore it rejoicing to Polycrates, and giving him the signet ring they told him in what manner it had been found. And he perceiving that the matter was of God, wrote upon paper all that he had done, and all that had happened to him, and having written he dispatched it to Egypt. Then Amasis, when he had read the paper which had come from Polycrates, 
perceived that it was impossible for man to rescue man from the event which was to come to pass, and that Polycrates was destined not to have a good end, being prosperous in all things, seeing that he found again even that which he cast away. Therefore he sent an envoy to him in Samos and said that he broke off the guest friendship, and this he did lest when a fearful and great mishap befell Polycrates, he might himself be grieved in his soul as for a man who was his guest. It was this Polycrates then, prosperous in all things, against whom the Lacedaemonians were making an expedition, being invited by those Samians who afterwards settled at Cadonia in Crete, to come to their assistance. Now Polycrates had sent an envoy to Cambyses the son of Cyrus without the knowledge of the Samians, as he was gathering an army to go against Egypt, and had asked him to send to him in Samos, and to ask for an armed force. So Cambyses hearing this very readily sent to Samos to ask Polycrates to send a naval force with him against Egypt. And Polycrates selected of the citizens those whom he most suspected of desiring to rise against him and sent them away in forty triremes, charging Cambyses not to send them back. Now some say that those of the Samians who were sent away by Polycrates never reached Egypt, but when they arrived on their voyage at Carpathos, they considered with themselves and resolved not to sail on any further. Others say that they reached Egypt and being kept under guard there, they made their escape from thence. Then, as they were sailing into Samos, Polycrates encountered them with ships and engaged battle with them, and those who were returning home had the better and landed in the island, but having fought a land battle in the island, they were worsted, and so sailed to Lacedaemon. Some however say that those from Egypt defeated Polycrates in the battle, but this in my opinion is not correct for there would have been no need for them to invite the assistance of the Lacedaemonians if they had been able by themselves to bring Polycrates to terms. Moreover, it is not reasonable either, seeing that he had foreign mercenaries and native archers very many in number, to suppose that he was worsted by the returning Samians, who were but few. Then Polycrates gathered together the children and wives of his subjects, and confined them in the ship sheds, keeping them ready so that, if it should prove that his subjects deserted to the side of the returning exiles, he might burn them with the sheds. When those of the Samians who had been driven out by Polycrates reached Sparta, they were introduced before the magistrates and spoke at length being urgent in their request. The magistrates, however, at the first introduction, replied that they had forgotten the things which had been spoken at the beginning and did not understand those which were spoken at the end. After this they were introduced a second time, and bringing with them a bag they said nothing else but this, namely that the bag was in want of meal, to which the others replied that they had overdone it with the bag. However, they resolved to help them. Then the Lacedaemonians prepared a force and made expedition to Samos, in repayment of former services, as the Samians say, because the Samians had first helped them with ships against the Messenians, but the Lacedaemonians say that they made the expedition not so much from desire to help the Samians at their request, as to take vengeance on their own behalf, for the robbery of the mixing bowl which they had been bearing as a gift to Croesus, and of the corslet which Amasis the king of Egypt had sent as a gift to them, for the Samians had carried off the corslet also in the year before they took the bowl and it was of linen with many figures woven into it, and embroidered with gold and with cotton, and each thread of this corslet is worthy of admiration, for that being itself fine, it has in it three hundred and sixty fibers, all plain to view. 
Such another as this moreover is that which Amasis dedicated as an offering to Athene at Lindos. The Corinthians also took part with zeal in this expedition against Samos, that it might be carried out, for there had been an offense perpetrated against them also by the Samians a generation before the time of this expedition, and about the same time as the robbery of the bull. Periander the son of Capselos had dispatched three hundred sons of the chief men of Corsera to Aliots at Sardis to be made eunuchs, and when the Corinthians who were conducting the boys had put into Samos, the Samians, being informed of the story and for what purpose they were being conducted to Sardis, first instructed the boys to lay hold of the temple of Artemis. And then they refused to permit the Corinthians to drag the suppliants away from the temple. And as the Corinthians cut the boys off from supplies of food, the Samians made a festival, which they celebrate even to the present time in the same manner. For when night came on, as long as the boys were suppliants they arranged dances of maidens and youths. And in arranging the dances they made it a rule of the festival that sweet cakes of sesame and honey should be carried, in order that the coarser and boys might snatch them, and so have support. And this went on so long that at last the Corinthians who had charge of the boys departed and went away, and as for the boys, the Samians carried them back to Cursera. Now, if after the death of Periander the Corinthians had been on friendly terms with the Corserans, they would not have joined in the expedition against Samos for the cause which has been mentioned, but as it is, they have been ever at variance with one another since they first colonized the island. This then was the cause why the Corinthians had a grudge against the Samians. Now Periander had chosen out the sons of the chief men of Cursera, and was sending them to Sardis to be made eunuchs, in order that he might have revenge, since the Corserans had first begun the offense and had done to him a deed of reckless wrong. For after Periander had killed his wife Melissa, it chanced to him to experience another misfortune, in addition to that which had happened to him already, and this was as follows. He had by Melissa two sons, the one of seventeen and the other of eighteen years. These sons their mother's father Procles, who was despot of Epidoros, sent for to himself and kindly entertained, as was to be expected seeing that they were the sons of his own daughter, and when he was sending them back, he said in taking leave of them, Do ye know, boys? who it was that killed your mother. Of this saying the elder of them took no account, but the younger, whose name was Lycophron, was grieved so greatly at hearing it, that when he reached Corinth again he would neither address his father, nor speak to him when his father would have conversed with him, nor give any reply when he asked questions, regarding him as the murderer of his mother. At length Periander being enraged with his son drove him forth out of his house. And having driven him forth, he asked of the elder son what his mother's father had said to them in his conversation. He then related how Procles had received them in a kindly manner, but of the saying which he had uttered when he parted from them he had no remembrance, since he had taken no note of it. So Periander said that it could not be, but that he had suggested to them something, and urged him further with questions, and he after that remembered, and told of this also. Then Periander taking note of it and not desiring to show any indulgence, sent a messenger to those with whom the son who had been driven forth, was living at that time, and forbade them to receive him into their houses, and whenever having been driven away from one house he came to another, he was driven away also from this, since Periander threatened those who received him, and commanded them to exclude him, and so being driven away again he would go to another house, 
where persons lived who were his friends, and they perhaps received him because he was the son of Periander, notwithstanding that they feared. At last Periander made a proclamation that whosoever should either receive him into their houses, or converse with him, should be bound to pay a fine to Apollo, stating the amount that it should be. Accordingly, by reason of this proclamation, no one was willing either to converse with him or to receive him into their house, and moreover even he himself did not think it fit to attempt it, since it had been forbidden, but he lay about in the portico's enduring exposure. And on the fourth day after this, Periander seeing him fallen into squalid misery and starvation, felt pity for him, and abating his anger he approached him and began to say, Son, which of these two is to be preferred, the fortune which thou dost now experience and possess, or to inherit the power and wealth which I possess now, by being submissive to thy father's will? Thou, however, being my son and the prince of wealthy Corinth, didst choose nevertheless the life of a vagabond by making opposition and displaying anger against him, with whom it behoved thee least to deal so, for if any misfortune happened in those matters, for which cause thou hast suspicion against me, this has happened to me first, and I am sharer in the misfortune more than others, inasmuch as I did the deed myself. Do thou, however, having learned by how much to be envied is better than to be pitied, and at the same time what a grievous thing it is to be angry against thy parents, and against those who are stronger than thou, come back now to the house. Periander with these words endeavored to restrain him, but he answered nothing else to his father, but said only that he ought to pay a fine to the god for having come to speech with him. Then Periander, perceiving that the malady of his son was hopeless and could not be overcome, dispatched a ship to Cursira, and so sent him away out of his sight, for he was ruler also of that island, and having sent him away, Periander proceeded to make war against his father-in-law Procles, esteeming him most to blame for the condition in which he was, and he took Epidauros and took also Procles himself, and made him a prisoner. When however, as time went on, Periander had passed his prime and perceived within himself that he was no longer able to overlook and manage the government of the state, he sent to Cursira and summoned Lycophron to come back and take the supreme power, for in the elder of his sons, he did not see the required capacity, but perceived clearly that he was of wits too dull. Lycophron, however, did not deign even to give an answer to the bearer of his message. Then Periander, clinging still in affection to the youth, sent to him next his own daughter, the sister of Lycophron, supposing that he would yield to her persuasion more than to that of others, and she arrived there and spoke to him thus, Boy, dost thou desire that both the despotism should fall to others, and also the substance of thy father, carried off as plunder, rather than that thou shouldest return back and possess them? Come back to thy home? Cease to torment thyself. Pride is a mischievous possession. Heal not evil with evil. Many prefer that which is reasonable to that which is strictly just, and many year now in seeking the things of their mother, have lost the things of their father. Despotism is an insecure thing, and many desire it. Moreover he is now an old man and past his prime. Give not thy good things unto others. She thus said to him the most persuasive things, having been before instructed by her father. But he in answer said that he would never come to Corinth so long as he heard that his father was yet alive. When she had reported this, Periander the third time sent an envoy and said that he desired himself to come to Cursira, exhorting Lycophron at the same time to come back to Corinth 
and to be his successor on the throne. The son having agreed to return on these terms, Periander was preparing to sail to Cursira and his son to Corinth, but the Corsarans, having learned all that had taken place, put the young man to death in order that Periander might not come to their land. For this cause it was that Periander took vengeance on those of Cursira. The Lacedaemonians then had come with a great armament and were besieging Samos, and having made an attack upon the wall, they occupied the tower which stands by the sea in the suburb of the city, but afterwards when Polycrates came up to the rescue with a large body they were driven away from it. Meanwhile by the upper tower which is upon the ridge of the mountain, there had come out to the fight the foreign mercenaries and many of the Samians themselves, and these stood their ground against the Lacedaemonians for a short while, and then began to fly backwards, and the Lacedaemonians followed and were slaying them. Now if the Lacedaemonians there present had all been equal on that day to Archias and Lacopas, Samos would have been captured, for Archias and Lacopas alone rushed within the wall together with the flying Samians, and being shut off from retreat were slain within the city of the Samians. I myself moreover had converse in Pitane, for to that deem he belonged, with the third in descent from this Archias, another Archias the son of Samios the son of Archias, who honored the Samians of all strangers most, and not only so. But he said that his own father had been called Samios, because his father Archias had died by a glorious death in Samos, and he said that he honored Samians, because his grandfather had been granted a public funeral by the Samians. The Lacedaemonians then, when they had been besieging Samos for forty days and their affairs made no progress, set forth to return to Peloponnesus. But according to the less credible account which has been put abroad of these matters, Polycrates struck and led a quantity of a certain native coin, and having gilded the coins over, gave them to the Lacedaemonians, and they received them and upon that set forth to depart. This was the first expedition which the Lacedaemonians, being Dorians, 4601 made into Asia. Those of the Samians who had made the expedition against Polycrates themselves, also sailed away, when the Lacedaemonians were about to desert them, and came to Siphnos. For they were in want of money, and the people of Siphnos were then at their greatest height of prosperity, and possessed wealth more than all the other islanders, since they had in their island mines of gold and silver. So that there is a treasury dedicated at Delphi with the tithe of the money which came in from these mines, and furnished in a manner equal to the wealthiest of these treasuries. And the people used to divide among themselves the money which came in from the mines every year. So when they were establishing the treasury, they consulted the oracle as to whether their present prosperity was capable of remaining with them for a long time, and the Pythian prophetess gave them this reply. But when with white shall be shining forty-seven the hull of the city in Siphnos, and when the market is white of brow, one wary is needed then, to beware of an army forty-nine of wood, and a red-colored herald. Now just at that time the marketplace and city hall of the Siphnians had been decorated with Parian marble. This oracle they were not able to understand either then at first or when the Samians had arrived. For as soon as the Samians were putting into Siphnos they sent one of their ships to bear envoys to the city. Now in old times all ships were painted with red, and this was that which the Pythian prophetess was declaring beforehand to the Siphnians, bidding them guard against the army of wood and the red-colored herald. The messengers accordingly came and asked the Siphnians to lend them ten talents, and as they refused to lend to them, the Samians began to lay waste their lands. 
So when they were informed of it, forthwith the Scythians came to the rescue, and having engaged battle with them were defeated, and many of them were cut off by the Samians and shut out of the city, and the Samians after this imposed upon them a payment of a hundred talents. Then from the men of Hermion they received by payment of money the island of Hydri, which is near the coast of Peloponnese, and they gave it in charge to the Trezenians, but they themselves settled at Cadonia which is in Crete, not sailing thither for that purpose, but in order to drive the Zacynthians out of the island. Here they remained and were prosperous for five years, so much so that they were the builders of the temples which are now existing in Cadonia, and also of the house of Dictina. In the sixth year however the Aeginetans together with the Cretans conquered them in a sea fight and brought them to slavery, and they cut off the prows of their ships, which were shaped like boars, and dedicated them in the temple of Athene in Aegina. This the Aeginetans did because they had a grudge against the Samians, for the Samians had first made expedition against Aegina, when Amphicrates was king in Samos, and had done much hurt to the Aeginetans, and suffered much hurt also from them. Such was the cause of this event. And about the Samians I have spoken at greater length, because they have three works which are greater than any others that have been made by Hellenes. First a passage beginning from below and open at both ends, dug through a mountain not less than a hundred and fifty fathoms in height. The length of the passage is seven furlongs fifty-three, and the height and breadth each eight feet. And throughout the whole of it another passage has been dug twenty cubits in depth and three feet in breadth, through which the water is conducted and comes by the pipes to the city, brought from an abundant spring. And the designer of this work was a Megarian, Eupolinos the son of Nostrophos. This is one of the three, and the second is a mole in the sea about the harbor, going down to a depth of as much as 5420 fathoms, and the length of the mole is more than two furlongs. The third work which they have executed is a temple larger than all the other temples of which we know. Of this the first designer was Roikos the son of Philes, a native of Samos. For this reason I have spoken at greater length of the Samians. Now while Cambyses the son of Cyrus was spending a long time in Egypt and had gone out of his right mind, there rose up against him two brothers, Magians, of whom the one had been left behind by Cambyses as caretaker of his household. This man, I say, rose up against him perceiving that the occurrence of the death of Smyrtus was being kept secret, and that there were but few of the Persians who were aware of it, while the greater number believed without doubt that he was still alive. Therefore he endeavored to obtain the kingdom, and he formed his plan as follows. He had a brother, that one who, as I said, rose up with him against Cambyses, and this man in form very closely resembled Smyrtus, the son of Cyrus, whom Cambyses had slain, being his own brother. He was like Smyrtus, I say, in form, and not only so, but he had the same name, Smyrtus. Having persuaded this man that he would manage everything for him, the Magian Patizabs brought him and seated him upon the royal throne. And having so done he sent heralds about to the various provinces, and among others one to the army in Egypt, to proclaim to them that they must obey Smyrtus the son of Cyrus for the future instead of Cambyses. So then the other heralds made this proclamation, and also the one who was appointed to go to Egypt, finding Cambyses and his army at Agbatana in Syria, stood in the midst and began to proclaim that which had been commanded to him by the Magian. Hearing this from the herald, and supposing that the herald was speaking the truth and that he had himself been betrayed by Prezasps, 
that is to say, that when Prezasps was sent to kill Smyrtus he had not done so, Cambyses looked upon Prezasps and said. Prezasps, was it thus that thou didst perform for me the thing which I gave over to thee to do? And he said. Master. The saying is not true that Smyrtus thy brother has risen up against thee nor that thou wilt have any contention arising from him, either great or small. For I myself, having done that which thou didst command me to do, buried him with my own hands. If therefore the dead have risen again to life, then thou mayest expect that the Stiages also the Mede will rise up against thee, but if it is as it was before time, there is no fear now that any trouble shall spring up for you, at least from him. Now therefore I think it well that some should pursue after the herald and examine him, asking from whom he has come to proclaim to us that we are to obey Smyrtus as king. When Prezasps had thus spoken, Cambyses was pleased with the advice, and accordingly the herald was pursued forthwith and returned. Then when he had come back, Prezasps asked him as follows. Man, thou sayest that thou art come as a messenger from Smyrtus the son of Cyrus. Now therefore speak the truth and go away in peace. I ask thee whether Smyrtus himself appeared before thine eyes and charged thee to say this, or some one of those who serve him. He said. Smyrtus the son of Cyrus I have never yet seen since the day that King Cambyses marched to Egypt. But the magian whom Cambyses appointed to be guardian of his household, he, I say, gave me this charge, saying that Smyrtus the son of Cyrus was he who laid the command upon me to speak these things to you. Thus he spoke to them, adding no falsehoods to the first, and Cambyses said, Prezasps, Thou hast done that which was commanded thee like an honest man, and hast escaped censure, but who of the Persians may this be who has risen up against me and usurped the name of Smyrtus? He said, I seem to myself, O king, to have understanding of this which has come to pass. The Magians have risen against thee, Patizoths namely whom thou didst leave as caretaker of thy household, and his brother Smyrtus. Then Cambyses, when he heard the name of Smyrtus, perceived at once the true meaning of this report and of the dream, for he thought in his sleep that some one had reported to him that Smyrtus was sitting upon the royal throne and had touched the heaven with his head, and perceiving that he had slain his brother without need. He began to lament for Smyrtus, and having lamented for him and sorrowed greatly for the whole mishap. He was leaping upon his horse, meaning as quickly as possible to march his army to Susa against a Magian, and as he leapt upon his horse, the cap of his sword sheath fell off, and the sword being left bare struck his thigh. Having been wounded then in the same part where he had formerly struck a piss the god of the Egyptians, and believing that he had been struck with a mortal blow, Cambyses asked what was the name of that town, and they said Agbatana. Now even before this he had been informed by the oracle at the city of Buto that in Agbatana he should bring his life to an end and he supposed that he should die of old age in Agbatana in Media, where was his chief seat of power, but the oracle, it appeared, meant in Agbatana of Syria. So when by questioning now he learnt the name of the town, being struck with fear both by the calamity caused by the Magian, and at the same time by the wound, he came to his right mind, and understanding the meaning of the oracle he said. Here it is fated that Cambyses the son of Cyrus shall end his life. So much only he said at that time, but about twenty days afterwards he sent for the most honorable of the Persians who were with him, and said to them as follows. 
Persians, it has become necessary for me to make known to you the thing which I was wont to keep concealed beyond all other things. Being in Egypt I saw a vision in my sleep, which I would I had never seen, and it seemed to me that a messenger came from home and reported to me that Smyrtus was sitting upon the royal throne and had touched the heaven with his head. Fearing then lest I should be deprived of my power by my brother, I acted quickly rather than wisely, for it seems that it is not possible for man 55 to avert that which is destined to come to pass. I therefore, fool that I was, sent away Presasps to Susa to kill Smyrtus, and when this great evil had been done, I lived in security, never considering the danger that some other man might at some time rise up against me, now that Smyrtus had been removed. And altogether missing the mark of that which was about to happen, I have both made myself the murderer of my brother, when there was no need. And I have been deprived nonetheless of the kingdom, for it was in fact Smyrtus the Magian of whom the divine power declared to me beforehand in the vision that he should rise up against me. So then, as I say, this deed has been done by me, and ye must imagine that ye no longer have Smyrtus the son of Cyrus alive. But it is in truth the Magians who are masters of your kingdom, he whom I left as guardian of my household and his brother Smyrtus. The man then who ought above all others to have taken vengeance on my behalf for the dishonor which I have suffered from the Magians, has ended his life by an unholy death received from the hands of those who were his nearest of kin, and since he is no more, it becomes most needful for me, as the thing next best of those which remain, to charge you, O Persians, with that which dying I desire should be done for me. This then I lay upon you, calling upon the gods of the royal house to witness it upon you and most of all upon those of the Achaemenidae, who are present here that ye do not permit the return of the chief power to the Medes, but that if they have acquired it by craft, by craft they be deprived of it by you, or if they have conquered it by any kind of force, by force, and by a strong hand, ye recover it. And if ye do this, may the earth bring forth her produce, and may your wives and your cattle be fruitful, while ye remain free forever, but if ye do not recover the power nor attempt to recover it, I pray that curses the contrary of these blessings may come upon you, and moreover that each man of the Persians may have an end to his life like that which has come upon me. Then as soon as he had finished speaking these things, Cambyses began to bewail and make lamentation for all his fortunes. And the Persians, when they saw that the king had begun to bewail himself, both rent the garments which they wore and made lamentation without stint. After this, when the bone had become diseased and the thigh had mortified, Cambyses the son of Cyrus was carried off by the wound, having reigned in all seven years and five months, and being absolutely childless, both of male and female offspring. The Persians meanwhile who were present there were very little disposed to believe that the power was in the hands of the Magians. On the contrary, they were surely convinced that Cambyses had said that which he said about the death of Smyrtus to deceive them, in order that all the Persians might be moved to war against him. These then were surely convinced that Smyrtus the son of Cyrus was established to be king, for Presasps also very strongly denied that he had slain Smyrtus, since it was not safe, now that Cambyses was dead for him to say that he had destroyed with his own hand the son of Cyrus. Thus when Cambyses had brought his life to an end, the Magian became king without disturbance, usurping the place of his namesake Smyrtus, the son of Cyrus, and he reigned during the seven months which were wanting yet to Cambyses for the completion of the eight years.
and during them he performed acts of great benefit to all his subjects. So that after his death all those in Asia except the Persians themselves mourned for his loss. For the Magian sent messengers abroad to every nation over which he ruled, and proclaimed freedom from military service, and from tribute for three years. This proclamation, I say, he made it once when he established himself upon the throne. But in the eighth month it was discovered who he was in the following manner. There was one Atanes the son of Farnisps, in birth and in wealth not inferior to any of the Persians. This Atanes was the first who had had suspicion of the Magian, that he was not Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, but the person that he really was, drawing his inference from these facts, namely that he never went abroad out of the fortress, and that he did not summon into his presence any of the honorable men among the Persians. And having formed a suspicion of him, he proceeded to do as follows. Cambyses had taken to wife his daughter, whose name was Phaedim, 58, and this same daughter the Magian at that time was keeping as his wife and living with her, as with all the rest also of the wives of Cambyses. Atanes therefore sent a message to this daughter and asked her who the man was by whose side she slept, whether Smyrtus the son of Cyrus or some other. She sent back word to him saying that she did not know, for she had never seen Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, nor did she know otherwise who he was who lived with her. Atanes then sent a second time and said, if thou dost not thyself know Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, then do thou ask of Atasa who this man is, with whom both she and thou live as wives, for assuredly it must be that she knows her own brother. To this the daughter sent back word. I am not able either to come to speech with Atasa or to see any other of the women who live here with me, for as soon as this man, whosoever he may be, succeeded to the kingdom, he separated us and placed us in different apartments by ourselves. When Atanes heard this, the matter became more and more clear to him, and he sent another message in to her, which said, Daughter, it is right for thee, nobly born as thou art, to undertake any risk which thy father bids thee take upon thee. For if in truth this is not Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, but the man whom I suppose, he ought not to escape with impunity, either for taking thee to his bed or for holding the dominion of Persians. But he must pay the penalty. Now therefore do as I say. When he sleeps by thee and thou perceivest that he is sound asleep, feel his ears, and if it prove that he has ears, then believe that thou art living with Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, but if not, believe that it is with the Magian Smyrtus. To this Phaedim sent an answer saying that, if she should do so, she would run a great risk, for supposing that he should chance not to have his ears, and she were detected feeling for them, she was well assured that he would put her to death, but nevertheless she would do this, so she undertook to do this for her father. But as for this Magian Smyrtus, he had had his ears cut off by Cyrus the son of Cambyses when he was king, for some grave offense. This Phaedim then, the daughter of Atanes, proceeding to perform all that she had undertaken for her father, when her turn came to go to the Magian, for the wives of the Persians go into them regularly each in her turn, came and lay down beside him. And when the Magian was in deep sleep, she felt his ears, and perceiving not with difficulty, but easily that her husband had no ears. So soon as it became day she sent and informed her father of that which had taken place. Then Atanes took to him Aspathines and Gabrias, 59, who were leading men among the Persians, and also his own most trusted friends, and related to them the whole matter. And they, as it then appeared, 
had suspicions also themselves that it was so, and when Atanes reported this to them, they readily accepted his proposals. Then it was resolved by them that each one should associate with himself that man of the Persians whom he trusted most, so Atanes brought in Intifrenes, Gabrias brought in Megabizos, and Aspathenes brought in Hydarns. When they had thus become six, Darius the son of Histisps arrived at Susa, having come from the land of Persia, for of this his father was governor. Accordingly when he came, the six men of the Persians resolved to associate Darius also with themselves. These then having come together, being seven in number, gave pledges of faith to one another and deliberated together, and when it came to Darius to declare his opinion, he spoke to them as follows. I thought that I alone knew this, namely that it was the Magian who was reigning as king, and that Smyrtus the son of Cyrus had brought his life to an end, and for this very reason I am come with earnest purpose to contrive death for the Magian. Since however it has come to pass that ye also know and not I alone, I think it well to act at once, and not to put the matter off, for that is not the better way. To this replied Ot Ains, Son of Histisps, thou art the scion of a noble stock, and thou art showing thyself, as it seems, in no way inferior to thy father. Do not however hasten this enterprise so much without consideration, but take it up more prudently, for we must first become more in numbers, and then undertake the matter. In answer to this Darius said, Men who are here present, if ye shall follow the way suggested by Atanes, know that ye will perish miserably, for some one will carry word to the Magian, getting gain thereby privately for himself. Your best way would have been to do this action upon your own risk alone, but since it seemed good to you to refer the matter to a greater number, and ye communicated it to me, either let us do the deed today, or be ye assured that if this present day shall pass by, none other shall prevent me as your accuser, but I will myself tell these things to the Magian. To this Atanes, when he saw Darius in violent haste, replied, since thou dost compel us to hasten the matter and dost not permit us to delay, come expound to us thyself in what manner we shall pass into the palace and lay hands upon them. For that there are guards set in various parts, thou knowest probably thyself as well as we. If not from sight at least from hearsay, and in what manner shall we pass through these? Darius made reply with these words. Atanes, there are many things in sooth which it is not possible to set forth in speech, but only in deed, and other things there are which in speech can be set forth, but from them comes no famous deed. Know ye however that the guards which are set are not difficult to pass. For in the first place, we being what we are, there is no one who will not let us go by, partly, as may be supposed, from having respect for us. And partly also perhaps from fear, and secondly I have myself a most specious pretext by means of which we may pass by, for I shall say that I am just now come from the Persian land, and desire to declare to the king a certain message from my father. For where it is necessary that a lie be spoken, let it be spoken, seeing that we all aim at the same object. Both they who lie and they who always speak the truth, those lie whenever they are likely to gain anything by persuading with their lies, and these tell the truth in order that they may draw to themselves gain by the truth, and that things may be entrusted to them more readily. Thus, while practicing different ways, we aim all at the same thing. If however they were not likely to make any gain by it, the truth teller would lie, and the liar would speak the truth, with indifference. 
Whosoever then of the doorkeepers shall let us pass by of his own free will, for him it shall be the better afterwards, but whosoever shall endeavor to oppose our passage, let him then, and there be marked as our enemy, and after that let us push in and set about our work. Then said Gabrias, Friends, at what time will there be a fairer opportunity for us either to recover our rule, or, if we are not able to get it again, to die? Seeing that we being Persians on the one hand lie under the rule of a Mede, a Magian, and that to a man whose ears have been cut off. Moreover all those of you who stood by the side of Cambyses when he was sick remember assuredly what he laid upon the Persians, as he was bringing his life to an end, if they should not attempt to win back the power, and this we did not accept then, but suppose that Cambyses had spoken in order to deceive us. Now therefore I give my vote that we follow the opinion of Darius, and that we do not depart from this assembly to go any wither else, but straight to attack the Magian. Thus spoke Gabrias, and they all approved of this proposal. Now while these were thus taking counsel together, it was coming to pass by coincidence as follows. The Magians taking counsel together had resolved to join Presasps with themselves as a friend, both because he had suffered grievous wrong from Cambyses, who had killed his son by shooting him, and because he alone knew for a certainty of the death of Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, having killed him with his own hands. And finally because Presasps was in very great repute among the Persians. For these reasons they summoned him and endeavored to win him to be their friend, engaging him by pledge and with oaths, that he would assuredly keep to himself, and not reveal to any man the deception which had been practiced by them upon the Persians, and promising to give him things innumerable in return. After Presasps had promised to do this, the Magians, having persuaded him so far, proposed to him a second thing, and said that they would call together all the Persians to come up to the wall of the palace, and bade him go up upon a tower and address them, saying that they were living under the rule of Smyrtus, the son of Cyrus and no other. This they so enjoined because they supposed that he had the greatest credit among the Persians, and because he had frequently declared the opinion that Smyrtus the son of Cyrus was still alive, and had denied that he had slain him. When Presasp said that he was ready to do this also, the Magians having called together the Persians, caused him to go up upon a tower, and bade him address them. Then he chose to forget those things which they asked of him, and beginning with Achaemenes, he traced the descent of Cyrus on the father's side, and then, when he came down to Cyrus, he related at last what great benefits he had conferred upon the Persians, and having gone through this recital, he proceeded to declare the truth, saying that formerly he kept it secret, since it was not safe for him to tell of that which had been done. But at the present time he was compelled to make it known. He proceeded to say how he had himself slain Smyrtus the son of Cyrus, being compelled by Cambyses, and that it was the Magians who were now ruling. Then he made imprecation of many evils on the Persians, if they did not win back again the power and take vengeance upon the Magians, and upon that he let himself fall down from the tower head foremost. Thus Presasps ended his life, having been throughout his time a man of repute. Now the seven of the Persians, when they had resolved forthwith to lay hands upon the Magians and not to delay, made prayer to the gods and went knowing nothing of that which had been done with regard to Presasps. And as they were going and were in the middle of their course, they heard that which had happened about Presasps. Upon that they retired out of the way and again considered with themselves, 
Atanes and his supporters, strongly urging that they should delay and not set to the work when things were thus disturbed, while Darius and those of his party urged that they should go forthwith and do that which had been resolved, and not delay. Then while they were contending, there appeared seven pairs of hawks pursuing two pairs of vultures, plucking out their feathers and tearing them. Seeing this the seven all approved the opinion of Darius, and thereupon they went to the king's palace, encouraged by the sight of the birds. When they appeared at the gates, it happened nearly as Darius supposed, for the guards, having respect for men who were chief among the Persians, and not suspecting that anything would be done by them of the kind proposed, allowed them to pass in under the guiding of heaven, and none asked them any question. Then when they had passed into the court, they met the eunuchs who bore in the messages to the king, and these inquired of them for what purpose they had come, and at the same time they threatened with punishment the keepers of the gates for having let them pass in, and tried to stop the seven when they attempted to go forward. Then they gave the word to one another, and drawing their daggers stabbed these men there upon the spot, who tried to stop them, and themselves went running on towards the chamber of the men. Now the magians happened both of them to be there within, consulting about that which had been done by Presasps. So when they saw that the eunuchs had been attacked and were crying aloud, they ran back both of them, and perceiving that which was being done, they turned to self-defense. And one of them got down his bow and arrows before he was attacked, while the other had recourse to his spear. Then they engaged in combat with one another, and that one of them who had taken up his bow and arrows, found them of no use, since his enemies were close at hand and pressed hard upon him, but the other defended himself with his spear, and first he struck Aspathenes in the thigh, and then Intifrenes in the eye, and Intifrenes lost his eye by reason of the wound, but his life he did not lose. These then were wounded by one of the magians, but the other, when his bow and arrows proved useless to him, fled into a bedchamber which opened into the chamber of the men, intending to close the door, and with him there rushed in two of the seven, Darius and Gabrias. And when Gabrias was locked together in combat with the Magian, Darius stood by and was at a loss what to do, because it was dark, and he was afraid lest he should strike Gabrias. Then seeing him standing by idle, Gabrias asked why he did not use his hands, and he said, Because I am afraid lest I may strike thee. And Gabrias answered, Thrust with thy sword even though it stab through us both. So Darius was persuaded, and he thrust with his danger and happened to hit the magian. So when they had slain the magians and cut off their heads, they left behind those of their number who were wounded, both because they were unable to go, and also in order that they might take charge of the fortress, and the five others taking with them the heads of the magians, ran with shouting and clashing of arms, and called upon the other Persians to join them, telling them of that which had been done and showing the heads. And at the same time they proceeded to slay every one of the magians who crossed their path. So the Persians when they heard of that which had been brought to pass by the seven and of the deceit of the magians, thought good themselves also to do the same, and drawing their daggers, they killed the magians wherever they found one, so that if night had not come on and stopped them, they would not have left a single magian alive. This day the Persians celebrate in common more than all other days, and upon it, they keep a great festival which is called by the Persians the festival of the slaughter of the magians, on which no magian is permitted to appear abroad, but the magians keep themselves within their houses throughout that day. 
When the two mult had subsided and more than five days had elapsed, those who had risen against the magians began to take counsel about the general state, and there were spoken speeches which some of the Hellenes do not believe were really uttered, but spoken they were nevertheless. On the one hand Atanes urged that they should resign the government into the hands of the whole body of the Persians, and his words were as follows. To me it seems best that no single one of us should henceforth be ruler, for that is neither pleasant nor profitable. Ye saw the insolent temper of Cambyses, to what lengths it went, and ye have had experience also of the insolence of the Magian. And how should the rule of one alone be a well-ordered thing, seeing that the monarch may do what he desires without rendering any account of his acts? Even the best of all men, if he were placed in this disposition, would be caused by it to change from his wonted disposition. For insolence is engendered in him by the good things which he possesses, and envy is implanted in man from the beginning, and having these two things, he has all vice. For he does many deeds of reckless wrong, partly moved by insolence proceeding from satiety, and partly by envy. And yet a despot at least ought to have been free from envy, seeing that he has all manner of good things. He is however naturally in just the opposite temper towards his subjects, for he grudges to the nobles that they should survive and live, but delights in the basest of citizens, and he is more ready than any other man to receive calumnies. Then of all things he is the most inconsistent, for if you express admiration of him moderately, he is offended that no very great court is paid to him, whereas if you pay court to him extravagantly, he is offended with you for being a flatterer. And the most important matter of all is that which I am about to say. He disturbs the customs handed down from our fathers, he is a ravisher of women, and he puts men to death without trial. On the other hand the rule of many has first a name attaching to it, which is the fairest of all names, that is to say equality, next, the multitude does none of those things which the monarch does. Offices of state are exercised by lot, and the magistrates are compelled to render account of their action. And finally all matters of deliberation are referred to the public assembly. I therefore give as my opinion that we let monarchy go and increase the power of the multitude, for in the many is contained everything. And that's not all, our experts and regular viewers respond to all comments. Also check if you forgot to subscribe and set your bell to receive notifications about new audiobooks and other useful self-development materials that we release regularly. Join in the discussions, don't forget to give likes and, if possible and inspired, support the development of the channel financially. All useful links will be in the description and the first attached comment. Goodness love and wisdom to all. And now move on to watch the next part of the video at the links below, or choose something from the playlists of the channel and those you see on the screen.